Access denied. Okay. Give me a second to catch my breath and I'll, I'll try again. Oh, hey there. Welcome to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Fatchett. If you've never listened to the show before, in addition to providing entertaining and informative photography-related info, I also go on adventures with the crew of the Starship Fibonacci. Ugh. If you, this is your first time here, I highly recommend you subscribe to the podcast so you can listen to future en- endeavors. Uh, right now, I'm I'm trying to unlock this blast door to get back to the ship, but I have, have to make a post on the equivalent of intergalactic Facebook, though you can't really call it that since some of these beings don't really have what you would consider faces. Uh, I need to get at least 100 approvals to unlock this door, and I figured out if I do a particular dance with the right music and I use the proper keywords, enough accounts might see my post to get enough interactions for it to be distributed to a wider audience where I might get the necessary number of approvals. Ugh, it takes a lot of effort, and I need a minute to, before I do that dance again. While we're here, I'd really like to thank fans William Robbins and Aaron Churilla, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, for supporting the podcast. If you'd like to support the show, just go to nerdyphotographer.com and click on the support link. There are lots of ways to show your love. Thank you again, William and Aaron. On this episode of the podcast, I'm talking with photographer Myron Fields about the pitfalls photographers can fall into when it comes to social media because you don't want to spend too much time and energy in efforts that aren't going to help your business. That conversation right after the break. Speaking of energy and effort, let's try this again. Access denied. Damn it. you ready to take your website design to the next level? Look no further than Elementor, the cutting-edge WordPress website builder designed for professionals like you. With Elementor, you have the power to create entire website themes and layouts that are as unique as your imagination. Say goodbye to rigid templates and constraints. Elementor empowers you to design custom headers, footers, pages, posts, archive pages, and even WooCommerce product pages, all from a single user-friendly platform. The best part? You don't need to be a coding wizard to use Elementor. Say farewell to the days of wrestling with complex code or being dependent on a myriad of plugins. Elementor offers you a seamless, code-free design experience that puts you in control. So why limit your creativity? Choose Elementor and unleash your website design potential. Elevate your online presence with a website that truly represents your vision and brand. Get started with Elementor today. Just go to nerdyphotographer.com slash recommends slash Elementor and witness the transformation of your WordPress web design experience. It's time to build an extraordinary website with ease and finesse. Don't wait. Create with Elementor. Hello and welcome to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Fatchett, and I'm here today for the second time with uh, wedding and portrait photographer Myron Fields. Welcome, Myron. Hey, Casey. How's it going? I'm doing great. I'm really glad you came back. Uh, before we get into the main conversation, we're going to start out with a dice breaker. And, woo. and it's a 20. You rolled a natural 20. Uh, you get 60 seconds to tell us why the camera system that you use is the best and why everybody else should use the same. Uh, the camera system I use is the best because it works. Um, and... Since it works, everyone else should use it. It works for me as a professional, uh, whether I'm photographing portraits, weddings, or if I'm just even hanging out with my nine-month-old making images of her. So since it works for me, it'll work for anyone else. So you're basically saying that whatever works for you is the camera that you should should use, or are you saying... Isn't that, that what all photographers say anyway? <laughs> I don't know about all of them. I got a, uh, I got a lot of uh, reactions to my uh, reel where I was like, saying we judge people based on uh, what camera you use and that i mean that's a joke for me like uh but there were a lot of people who were like oh yeah if you're like using nikon i'm definitely like like i was like whoa 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 this is this is a this is humor this is not me like personally saying <laughs> that i judge anybody you must not have been on threads recently there's a whole uh, oh, conversation man. about uh liker users <laughs> uh threads i i am worrying is turning right into twitter um <laughs> I think it's evolved very quickly. Um, but yeah, I saw that like a conversation and yes, I'd love to have one, but I don't have nine grand that I'm just like able to toss on another camera 
just for because I want to have a cool looking Leica. Um, but yes, they, I mean they're made that way so the, it's a status item. Like there's there's with well, a big red dot is there for a reason. It's like so you see it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to have one, but uh, it's that's in the category of cool toys. Um, because otherwise, I mean, uh, I don't know what I'm using it for. I once heard a quote that said the difference between a man and a boy is the price of his toys. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We're a, a, adult money is one of the things that I've uh, childhood dreams and adult money is the, uh, the, the two collide. <laughs> Uh, speaking of social media, that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, why do photographers, it seems like, gear their social media many times towards other photographers instead of people who could hire them? And uh, I think that that's, uh, why do you think that photographers do that? Instead of like trying to reach potential clients, they're talking to other photographers. I think it's easy for photographers who have probably started by being in community with other photographers to have their technical abilities shaped by the opinions of other photographers. And now that they've started to build this photography business, they built it by creating images that are technically with the voice of other photographers in their ears whilst endeavoring to hire paying normal people who have no interest in Leica, Canon, Fuji, or whatever. And as a result, there is the disconnect. Um, I have been there before, and I think you can probably also relate where <clears throat> when you start, you know, you're in these groups and everyone's talking about what's the best camera to have, what's the best thing to do. And you start to develop a, a smaller group of friends and they, you know, you guys start talking over gear and lighting and all the other things. And before you know it, you've <clears throat> been a part of community for some time. Um, I know I have been a part of community for quite some time, <clears throat> and I still am. It's just my perspective has changed. And um, if we're not careful, we can start to create images for our paying clients. <clears throat> there are nothing more than lifeless representation of images. They're, they're just gimmick images. And they're just images with no meaning. And that becomes a disconnect. Yeah, I think that my, the word that I, uh, is my word for 2024 is uh, intention a lot of those images are created without intention. They're for attention um, instead of intention. And the thing that gets me is that, you know, I have friends who shoot, I'm a Canon guy. I have friends who shoot Nikon, Fuji, you know, there, there's, we don't care amongst the, like, I don't care what you shoot is. And over in the thousands of clients I have had in my 20 plus year career, I can count on one hand how many have asked me what gear I use. Like, the, not including, you know, people who say, do you have backup equipment? Like, if you're going to a wedding, like, yes, I have backup equipment. But, like, I've specifically asked what brand you use. And those were clients who were amateur photographers themselves. And they were just like, oh, what do you use? Um, apart from that, they don't care. As long as you're producing quality images, they don't care about all the technical stuff. The, you know, as far as like creating images, I think there's a, it's easier in your mind as a photographer to speak to other photographers because you know what other photographers want to hear and you speak a common language as opposed to when it comes to clients and you, you know, don't necessarily know it's people who have not really delved into their own marketing and, and how to market themselves to clients don't know like the language that their clients their, or potential clients speak and, and how to. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I can relate. Um, and I see it as a common problem that you're this artist first 
who now has to build a business and the business has to discover who its clients are, who it wants to serve, what it wants to say with their images. And you've got to do some business work. You've got to do some discovery. You've got to do some brand discovery, some some voice of client discovery. And in order to do that, you've got to start asking better questions to people. You've got to start polling and, and asking questions of your past clients and, and prospective clients. And you've got to be a little bit smarter than um, just knowing what, what camera system works best and how to slap a 50 millimeter on, go to 1.2 and, and, and make an image. So <laughs> you've got to start really thinking like a, a, a business. And that becomes the challenge of many artists is transitioning from, from, from artists to entrepreneur or small business owner. Um, because you mentioned it, it's the marketing. Um, who am I marketing to? Who am I? Who do I want to serve? What is my demographic? All of these things have to be considered when you are trying to appeal to normal people versus trying to appeal to photographers. And um, it, it's, it's, it's something I, I'm so familiar with. Um, I think that... I, I used to sometimes not share certain images because they weren't technically sound, mm -hmm. but emotively they had so much emotion there. And I didn't know that they had so much emotion there until I was once on a call with a, with a past couple who I had delivered a wedding gallery to. And they asked about a couple of images. And I was like, oh, well, those images, I can include them, but they just aren't the best. They asked, can we see them? So I said, yeah, I'll send them. So I edited them. And they're like, well, we don't see anything wrong with these images. I'm so <laughs> glad that you sent them because these, these memories are just so important to us. And for me, I think it was the horizon line was 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 cutting the neck or something like that. And so, but the moment was there. And you know, it's oftentimes said that moment trumps uh, the technicality, the emotional However, weight. However, yeah, the the emotional weight. However, it is my endeavor, the endeavor of so many um, artists, mainly photographers, hopefully, hopefully, to be seen as someone who is. Um, endeavoring to to master their craft and so i can understand why sometimes you may not deliver certain images because it's not a representation of the intentional arts that you are sometimes just stuff happens yeah and i mean I, I i was looking through like some of my older work recently as i'm like backing up a lot of stuff and i see like i honestly i i, I think i have a high emotional quotient uh, yeah that like I delivered images even earlier in my career that I was just like, this is not technically perfect. Um, but I have like, this is just such an emotional moment and you can see it. And it, this also comes to the, the part of your, what you were just saying about like, list, like asking questions of, of clients. I ask questions of people who've hired me. I ask questions of people who didn't hire me whenever I get that, like, sorry, we went with somebody else email i say great thanks for letting me know i really appreciate you telling me can you tell me what was your like what was the main factor in your decision to go somewhere else that's all i ask and while i don't while not everybody like responds i get more valuable information honestly about what's going on for my business from the people who didn't hire me saying oh well this was like there was something in your portfolio that we didn't see. And I'm like, Oh, but I do that. And then I'm thinking like, Oh, I need to include that in my portfolio. If I want to get those types of jobs. And it's just something that you don't think about something you, that doesn't like get into your, you know, brain of thinking like, Oh, that is how people are making decisions. That's how the people on the other side, unless you ask them uh, it, what's going on. And then also you, when you ask the people who did hire you, like you said, you keep track of those things and you think of the words. Uh, one of the best, you know, things for me over the long term was I would send out, I didn't send questionnaires for a long time because I didn't realize how valuable it was, but I was getting reviews and I kept seeing the same words popping up in reviews that people were using, like makes me feel comfortable. Um, the, just the, uh, the word that has become, there were lots of words like people would say the candid or whatever emotional moments, whatever, but what it's, it's changed. The language has changed and now it's authenticity. 
It's all about like people will say like these moments are very authentic and real and not staged. So that's, and that's very important to the people who hire me. And it always has been while the verbiage has changed over the years, it's always been something that they were concerned about. And you find those things that concern your potential client, as opposed to like we mentioned the technical aspects that uh, mostly concern other photographers. So what would you say is the difference between social media posts that resonate with photographers versus those that resonate with a potential client? The difference, in my opinion, between those two posts are the amount of intention gone into what's showcased if you're trying to appeal to normal, everyday people. You know what are the pain points of future couples or someone having a portrait or a headshot being made, and you have put intention into crafting that message to show them that you can solve that pain point or you're educating or you're entertaining um, in a manner that it's geared toward the consumer versus geared towards the art of the artist. Um, I know undoubtedly that if I put up a high noon image that has um, a diagonal uh, uh, um, line of shadow and highlight that I place the person in the highlight and I've got nice blue skies, and I might have a cool pose. Photographers are gonna eat that shit st- stuff up. Sorry, you can say whatever you want. We do not. We don't. This this podcast, you can say whatever you want. Don't worry about it. <laughs> photographers are gonna eat that stuff up all day. Yeah, I, I can think of a particular photographer who does that a lot. Um, and I like it, but it's funny. So for this, let's let's take a step back. For this podcast, I actually did an experiment last night. I took a wedding gallery that I recently photographed, and I sent it out to three photographers, four. I sent it out to two of the photographers' wives, because we're friends, and I also sent it out to two other people who are just have nothing to do with photography. Hmm. The gallery has about 200 images because it was a shorter wedding. And I asked the people to select their favorites. Mm. It was so interesting seeing the photographer select the, what's known as the bangers, you know, where I might have (laughs) played with, played with diagonal composition or, or played with making a silhouette or creative lighting. Whereas the people who weren't photographers were, were, were um, geared towards the images that were a beautiful, beautiful first look of this couple. On a, on a rooftop that had the monument in the background and all the things. And knowing what I know about my clients and knowing what I know about photographers, I can guesstimate why, well, I can guess as to why certain images were chosen by the photographers and non-photographers. Um, and so in order to start making these images or posts that appeal to the consumer versus the artist, you have to have some type of research on your consumer. Um, you'll continue to get more research as you get more clients, but you've got to start somewhere. And maybe this is, you know, maybe someone listening to this podcast is a new photographer and they don't have any past clients. You have friends. And so one thing you can do is put together a gallery of images and show it to your friends and show it to photographers and see what's said by your friends who have nothing to do with photography versus what photographers have to say. And then start to build some 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 intention around around that. And if you are a photographer who has past clients, start to pull past clients. Okay. And you want to do some type of brand research on what past clients are saying about you, about your brand, about how you show up, how you make them feel, what they feel about your images. And see, does that resonate with your intention behind making images? And if not, you've got some work to do. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to you have to research. And if you're starting out, here's a, the, to go out with people who are just starting out, you also have to think about who you're trying to reach. Even if you don't have many past clients, but like you really have to put the thought into, and I'm sorry, this is the part of running a business and it's the part that most creatives hate. Um, I can tell you that I should have spent way more time uh, working on 
um, the business side of things when I started out. Uh, cause I was, at that point I was just like, oh, whatever job I, I'll take, whatever job I can get and I'll do the job mm-hmm. and I'll produce the types of images that, you know, I think are good for this client. And I didn't think about necessarily like, who am I reaching? And, uh, it, it became, there were some problems I had early on because of that. And that, that I think a lot of people probably would have given up. Um, but I stuck through it and, uh, I figured out that I needed to, hone in on who I was trying to reach and what the, you know, that brand awareness, I think this is, and this could be a whole other episode and I've already done some <laughs> episodes on, on branding, but it, it's the figuring out your place in the market and what you want to do and what separates you from other people. And the funny thing is I always hear, cause we're both in the wedding photography industry. I often hear from people when I like talk to people who are, starting out and they're like in their first year or so or two years of weddings. And I say like, well, who do you want to reach? What kind of weddings do you want to be for? And there, and a lot of them, I will say, I go like, I want to do luxury weddings. And I'm like, Hmm, you're just thinking about the money. Um, that's the first thing that's striking, striking you. And you're not thinking about like what that means as far as luxury brands. Um, you really need to dive into what luxury branding means. Um, I have a friend who is a luxury wedding photographer who lives around the corner from me and he's great at what he does. And he's like, I specifically, he's like, there are photos that I love that I can't post on my social media because my clientele, the people I market to won't like them. Um, his clients. Yeah. Like, it's, it's all about, it's all about brand. Which brings and, us to, um, <laughs> It brings me to a question that we had from uh, an audience member, Devin Rowland, who uh, <laughs> submitted several questions, friend, uh, g- uh, guest on the show. Um, Devin asks, how do you view your brand and what do you do to support that brand? Undoubtedly, my brand is geared towards legacy. We create editorial, documentary, timeless images. Um, you spoke about luxury, and I think photography in itself, if we want to be honest, it's a luxury. Mm. Now, I know that in, within the wedding world, there is this whole crafted niche of luxury weddings, and it is what it is. Um, I, for, my, for myself, we are a photography brand that creates editorial documentary images that are timeless, they're elegant. And we support that by showcasing timeless, elegant, editorial, documentary images, creative photography. We support that by our website. We support that by the the imagery and the verbiage used on our website. But as well as we support that in just how we create, create the whole client experience. It's not transactional at all. We're very hands-on. We're hopping on calls. We're talking with clients. We're trying to learn something about them so that we can tell their story. Um, and I want to know their story and not the story of the brand of clothing that they're wearing or, or right. shoes or things like that. I want to know their story because the more I know about their story, the better I'm able to create images about them. Now, I don't need to be best friends with them and, and know their whole story, but I need to know something about the couple. And the more I learn about the couple, not by necessarily what they say, but also just their energy together. So that's why we have engagement sessions mm-hmm. or some type of Zoom call or something. So that when I'm creating images, I can create images that really speak to the authenticity of the couple. So that when these children or their next generation of family see these images, they will speak to the authentic love that that couple has. And that is how we build legacy. Exactly. Oh, man. the I am... Picking up what you're putting down there, man. It's just the music to my ears. That's exactly the same thing that I, you know, work to do. Um, and what you mentioned, like it's not about the shoes or you know the clothes, whatever. Whereas if you're if you're trying to be a luxury brand and weddings, th- those are things you definitely need to consider. It, Don't get me wrong, I love a nice shoe and and, and all that <laughs> stuff. But what has taught me is that. Those moments are fleeting. They matter now, but 
they may not matter years from now. I have grandparents who are married in 1958, and it matters not to them what they wore on their wedding day. What matters to them is what they said at the altar and having it tested throughout 60 years of marriage. Exactly. And I think that that's what you're, what we have very similar clientele in, in that sense of like, we have people who are interested in legacy, authenticity, those things that, that, but in the broader sense, these are the things you need to figure out. I think that we can, you and I can probably go on and be like, yes, absolutely. But we're talking about our specific clients and in the broader sense of what, uh, for photographers out there before we like go down the rabbit hole of just like both being like, yeah, this is exactly what we should be. Um, you have to figure it out what it is for your clients, like for, for the clients. Yeah, most certainly. And, and it might be something else. There are, uh, I mean, there are certainly trends out there that speak to what, the uh, younger generations, younger than you and I, um, are looking for at their, their weddings. One of the things that I've started to see, I mean, we're fairly young. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not, and we're not old, old, but like we've, I think we're past the, the younger generation where people are normally getting married. <laughs> I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but uh, yeah. um, one of the things I saw that I n- wouldn't necessarily have picked that something would that would have can become trendy uh, is like the direct oh, fl- God, direct flash. I know what you're going to talk? No, no, about. no, 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 no. Direct flash, not blurry. Um, direct flash, um, which I don't hate. Again, it has to be intentional. Um, but what I like, it reminds me of, and I don't know, like generationally. If it reminds you, it reminds me of like eighties club photos. Yeah. Like studio 54, like that sort of vibe. And in a good way, like, it's just like, this is, this has a very, it, it's a nostalgic look. feel to it. Yeah. It has a nostalgia to it. It, it. It's, it has a simplicity to it, which again, when you think about like who, what, what these people are, what is that communicating to your, about your clientele and about trends of people that's, that's telling you a lot about what is in the mindset of the people who are doing the hiring, especially when it comes to event and uh, wedding photos. It's like, it's telling you that they want something that's not as complicated necessarily. Like they're, they're looking for that like simplistic thing from maybe it gives them something. Maybe it is giving them something emotionally and people buy and book because of emotions. Um, more so all day, often, every day, more often than anything else. It's because of like, an emotional hook. Like you said earlier, pain points, things that they worry about. What are the things they worry about? Um, and, and so even if, you know, if we, if we take this outside of the, the realm of, of, of wedding photography, let's, let's just talk about headshots. Yeah. There are so many ways to set up headshots. You can do a, you can do a four light look. You can do a five light look. Most people don't know the difference between three lights, one lights, or four lights. They just know what feels something to them or what that image makes them feel or how it makes that person look. And so the more research you know about how your clients want to feel, what your client's pain points are, how they want to be showcased, um, who the decision buyers, I mean, the decision makers are, the better you're able to create imagery um, and showcase that imagery online. Uh, but if you're only focused on photographers, then you want to show the most complex lighting exactly. sets, setups that there are. You know, you've got two lights in front. You've got two rim lights, a background light. One of them is blue. One of them is yellow. Yeah. Orange and cyan or whatever. And like, it's the, 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 yeah, you're trying to, you, you don't see a lot of like behind the scenes videos of like clamshell reflectors. Um, the, there's a, yeah, I, I, I think there's a big difference between, like you said, the decision makers. If you're talking about like corporate headshots versus like acting headshots, every time type of portrait photography, there's a different, you have to find who's making the decision in whatever type of photography and speak to them in a way that, that fulfills their needs. And like, that shows that, you know, what you're talking about a and B that, you know, what is important to them. And I think that that's, 
you know, it's really super important to like, to know what makes that decision maker make a decision because with like something like corporate headshots, it's not so much emotional though. There, I mean, subliminally it might be there, but I think that it's not the same as a family portrait or a wedding where they're thinking about the emotional content of things. But like you, if you're going to do, you know, you can have multiple niches and do different things. I do corporate work, but I like, I have a totally separate website for my corporate work because it's geared in an entirely different language. There's a reason that the nerdy photographer is completely separate from my photography work because I decided this is going to be a thing just for photographers, but this other thing is for my clients. Um, it's not the same thing. And you, you speak in a different language. Um, it's funny you say that because I have a separate brand just for editorial images. Um, when I want to be outside of the box and it's really just for fun and for practice, I keep that totally away from my wedding work. And every now and then I might sprinkle one or two in, but, um, I keep it separate for that reason. Yeah. It's just the brand. It's a, and it's you, you, I had, I think I've gotten a lot of, we, we talked recently about, uh, you know, going viral. <clears throat> I had a video that went kind of viral and they had a lot of like the good responses to it. And then there were a lot of like negative comments or like, Oh, you're, you're not a real photographer. You're, you're like, Cause you said whatever. And I'm like, it's a joke. First of all, and second, it's like, it's because you're also not seeing my photography work here. This is, this is, this is geared to talking to other photographers. And like, I, 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 that's why I keep it separate because things that I say here may not be how I deal with clientele. Um, it's a different, it's a different world. Uh, I like to keep them uh, walled off from one another. I have been a part and I, 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 I've heard some of these conversations on, you know, something as simple as the way you carry your photographer, the way that you carry your camera can determine whether you're a real photographer or not, or <laughs> um, the, the way that you, if you use your viewfinder versus your uh, LCD determines whether you're a real photographer or not, or use whatever works. What's, what's so interesting is that these rules that we have self-imposed guidelines and rules are really what's stopping us from being creative. I, I fear that one of the hugest problems that will stop an artist's creativity is ego. Mm -hmm. Ego is going to be the death of some of the artist's creativity because they're trying to show up and be something who they're not in order to appeal to other artists, namely other photographers. Right. Rather than leaning into creating something that has meaning stop being such an a purist or an absolutist break some fucking rules yeah and just create something that has meaning to it and so i i started to become the latter for too long i was worried about oh i can't showcase this because this isn't right or this isn't right or i can't do this I'm like no i feel like this i want to create this i know the rule but today I'm going to break, break it. it. You know what? Today, I'm going to blow out those highlights. <laughs> I don't give a damn about the highlights. My client does not care about the sky being blue or if the highlights are blown out. What they care about is the emotion right in front of them. Right. I think and that, so. I, I was going to say, I think that, you know, that's you. I think we have had the luxury of being around long enough to become somewhat comfortable in our photography to like know a what matters to our clients and b when to be, break the rules. I think that, the, and that's something I always tell photographers who are starting out. And I say like, well, you need to learn the rules, not because you always have to follow them, but you have to know it so that when you break it again, keep coming back around to this intention. Like you're breaking this intentionally because you know, you're going to get something else. Like, you, you know, okay, I'm ignoring my, you know, exposure triangle. Why? Because I know that I want to have something that is a long exposure and I know that it's going to get blown out, but what's going to happen is going to be really amazing. And it's going to really, you know, it's either going to speak to me if it's a personal project or it's going to speak to my client because whatever, or I'm just trying to create something and see what happens. Um, 
but you know, you have to understand those basics so that you know when you, how to break the rules. Um, have you ever heard of this book called the creative act by Rick Rubin? Yes. Have you read it yet? No, but it's on my list of many books. to read. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, I think every, I think everyone listening to this podcast should go either download the book on audible or go buy the book. Um, whether you adhere to it or not, it's a great book on knowing the rules and then knowing when to break them, not having such rigid guidelines behind the art you create. And this book is not necessarily solely on photography. It's not on photography at all, but it's just a book on uh, the creative way or the creative act um, and, and how we should start to think about creativity. And the greatest takeaway, one of the greatest takeaways for, for me from that book was um, to release the rules and to begin to experiment again. And um, it's so funny that I got this book right as my um, my daughter, um, who's nine months now, started to explore things. And so she doesn't know the rules of you can't go here, you can't do that. So she's crawling into places where she shouldn't be. She's exploring things. We've got wooden blocks for her. We've got also chew toys for her because she's teething. <laughs> And she doesn't want the chew toy. She wants the wooden blocks. And right. she wants to put all types of things in her mouth. But she has this curiosity that for some reason, as we age, we forget about that childlike curiosity. And once we lean back into that, which is some what the book is talking about, we begin to explore things that we would have never um, otherwise have known. Else we became like a child again and started to explore things. Yeah. it's. I think that... Uh, I mean, you kind of put the, the death of curiosity uh, and, you know, like if you can't be curious about things and like it, one of those, it kind of relates to the, that whole thing of like what makes a real photographer and what, whatever, and when you have these very stringent rules, everything has to fit within this box and, you know, you don't allow yourself to look outside of the box and, and for things that might interest you that you know what maybe helps you better connect with your clientele i have seen so many i mean older photographers i guess people who've been around for a long time who are like i don't know how to communicate with these people like and i still am figuring out how to communicate with you know gen z and like younger millennials and, and figuring out but i'm trying i'm trying to i'm like interested in like researching and like you know, just watching videos and like seeing what resonates with people and like going, okay. And now you're going viral. <laughs> that was like purely, <laughs> that was like, I just wanted to do something that was about photographers. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, um, if you don't start get curious about what connects you to people, like what connects your work to people, eventually your work is no longer going to like be relevant to the like younger people. Like it, it, if you worry about like generational changes, it, if you know, especially in our business of weddings um, or like family portraits, whatever people like, how do you connect to them? How do you feel like, how do, how do you reach their pain points and also like what emotionally drives them? And, you know, this is something that's changed a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. I'm going to kind of lead into this a little bit, but vi the way video has changed, like reels, TikTok, all of this stuff has changed things. At first I was a little hesitant on it. And I think a lot of it had to do with my own self-consciousness on camera. Um, mm -hmm. And just feeling like, Oh, you know, I don't want to like bring it, but like one of the things that I feel that, really resonates with a uh, younger generation is authenticity of you, you being real and being, and not being some sort of, you know, elevating yourself into this weird, um, uh, weird place of like, you know, I, I'm not being a real person and like talking about things that matter to them, obviously, but also like showing your own, like exposing yourself a little bit, uh, emotionally. Um, which I think is, or, or just like whatever information you have, even if you don't want, if you don't feel comfortable being emotional on camera, or whatever, um, or vulnerable, 
um, it's, it's sharing knowledge that will help them in a video format. I think resonates more with them because that's just how they consume things. Um, it's not as much, you know, sitting down and reading a, a huge like piece like that. That's sort of like the second level. You have to like hook them first with the, the you know, you personally, and then you get them to maybe like go and consume a longer form of media or, you know, that, that, that will, uh, may resonate, hopefully resonate with them further. But I mean, and to, I guess my question to you is what types of posts do you think resonate more with clientele as opposed to photographers? Casey, I think one of the things to remember is that that photographer is also a person. Before they are an artist, they're also a person. And something that resonates with people, no matter what you do, is always going to be authenticity and your ability to have empathy. Um, And so those are things that I oftentimes will use when I'm talking to people, no matter who they are, is, hey, you know what? I'm late because my kid just threw up on me. No, I'm not always well put together. Um, I was recently having a conversation with a past client, well, a past wedding client who has now come in for maternity and them knowing that, uh, we recently had a kid, you know, and them knowing that photography is full-time work. They're like, well, how do you balance it all? I just said, I don't, I don't know how to balance (laughs) it all. And I don't think there's balance. Some days I'm I'm an awesome husband and a poor business owner. And other days I'm a great uh, business owner and a poor husband. But one thing I can't afford to do is be a poor dad because my kid can't take care of herself. Right. And I think it's responses like that or posts or things like that that really resonate with people. They resonate with people beyond what they do because you can be a lawyer, but you're, you're facing the same thing if you're a, a parenting lawyer or if you're a small business owner, if you're a chef, whomever you are, if you're in the same situation, you can relate to that. Right. And so it's creating content via video that can relate to people, no matter what their niche is, is what I choose to do. However, it depends on your market and you have to know who your market is. Um, if, If you are a food photographer and you're trying to um, create short form video that will relate to small businesses. You've got to know their pain points. You've got to know how to speak to that authentically. And they need to see that oftentimes what they need to see one is just the person behind the brand. Um, that will help people resonate with you because Gen Z or millennials or just whomever you know we're we're tired of spending money with big corporations and we know nothing about the people behind them and the next time you find out some something about the person they're all either going off on on an uh a twitter rant or they're they have some scandal coming out about them but um people like to see the behind the scenes they like to see how the soup is made or how how the sausage is made and so when you show them that type of stuff then they're better able to 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 see the brand. They see the authenticity of the brand, hopefully. Um, and when you inject some empathy in there, then you really start to speak to people versus being this brand who's in this lofty uh, ivory tower who you can't be who can't be reached. Then it's like, oh well, I can't relate to that. Now there are instances where that it, that type of marketing might might be helpful. Uh, namely, if you're in corporate, um, but for your your average your average everyday Joe who is working with the consumer, um, I, I would say that short form video that is authentic, that has empathy, that shows how the soup is made, um, that that educates, um, not in the condescending manner. Right. Um, there's different ways to educate. You can educate through humor. You can educate through entertainment. Um, social media should be a place for entertainment. Social media should also be a place uh, for for information, for inspiration. 
And so when we begin to think about these things, there are so there's so much that we can do to 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 appeal to average people or to non-photographers, but you have to have a strategy. And so that goes back to marketing strategy. And you can't have a marketing strategy without knowing who you're talking to. So it all comes back down to doing some research and knowing who you're talking to. Yeah. Putting together a strategy of, of how you're going to and strategy is not just Instagram reels or Instagram. <laughs> strategy is so many things beyond just that that four by five screen. Yeah. Everything has to work together. As you you had talked about before, everything complements one another, your language. Your branding, all every branding aspect, like through your website, your communications, your social media, all those things have to like come together. And I think that what you're talking about is super valuable for people to consider. Like, I think, yes, they want to see behind the person behind, especially if you run a small business, if you're a photographer and you're like a solopreneur or whatever, if, even if you have a, a small team or whatever, you near the, you're the head honcho, like people want to see what's going on behind it. They want to know who they're dealing with and they want to see mm -hmm. if you are and they, uh, as a friend of mine, who's really into marketing once said like people like have a small, uh, people have a stronger and stronger bullshit detector. And, yes. and, and it's, and the like millennials, Gen Z alphas, like the thing is they have a higher, marketing IQ than any generations before them. They know when they're being sold to. So like you said, like bringing that authenticity and like, this is not just like, I'm not just pitching you to buy my product, to buy, like to book me as a photographer. And I think that that's a pitfall that a lot of people who don't know how to speak to clients as opposed to like, they're like, Oh, you know, I see, you know, like, I should just ask them to book me like at the end of every post. Uh, I should ask them to, you know, like every, at the end of every blog post or any or any social media post should be like, get in touch with me. Like, no, you like open a conversation, like find other ways to like bring them in. And it might take longer than it, you know, it did back in the 80s or 90s when all people were just like, hey, I'm a photographer. And people were like, OK, cool. I'm going to hire you, I guess. Um you know, just solely based on looking at a portfolio and going like, oh, they take a You don't get married on the first date. Yeah. You got to, you got to. Most some, people don't. <laughs> I've seen some uh, reality television that tells me otherwise. Um, the, but <laughs> how, well really <laughs> how well do those work out? How well do those work out? Yeah. Is it actually reality? No, it's not. Um, yeah. I think that. <laughs> you have to be willing to put in a longer, have a longer relationship with clients than you are going to have with photographers. If you're going to, you know, if when you're posting stuff to social media or whatever your branding you're doing. Um, one thing I'll throw out there is like a number one, don't include technical information. If you're trying to uh, reach potential clients, because nobody cares what you're setting yeah. for. <clears throat> or you know, I do that sometimes. But I, I know that there's a lot, of, you know, I've actually had the opportunity to photograph weddings of photographers last year um, in the year before last. I've um, photographed this year, well, 2023. I can think of one, two, three, probably four photographers' weddings who I, who I have photographed. And so it's always an honor to photograph the wedding of people who have refined eyes. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes we include technical information just because it's it's something to get conversation started with photographers. Um, but your average Joe cares nothing about the shutter speed, your ISO. <laughs> All they care about is, can I see myself? Do we look good? What's the emotion going on? They don't care if your ISO is zero or if it was a uh, 12,800. <laughs> they, they they're concerned about whether they can see themselves in that photo. Mm-hmm. Which brings me, I think that's a good place to. And they, they also don't care if it was film or digital. Exactly. It's gotten way past that concern. Like, I, I still will shoot film if a client wants it. I mean, they're paying a premium for it. But otherwise, you know, I'm, I, 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 I use film for personal projects. So I have a few more. I think that's a good place to end our uh, discussion of social media. I have a few questions, more questions for you from Devin, who, like, oh, God. Who, who sent in a few. Questions. Um, 
Number one, uh, is your height ever a problem when you're photographing? And people realize it's never a problem with <laughs> photographing. I'm six five, and I intentionally don't like to show that I'm six five in my compositions. And so, oftentimes, if you've ever seen me photographing, I might be standing on something or I might be low to the ground, but I never want you knowing that I'm six five because that would just be me being lazy to just never vary my angle. Uh, that's one of my biggest, uh, when people ask me how to change things up in their photography, I'm like, get a different perspective, get low, get high up, get like thinking a different, from a different perspective than just your eye line. I mean, I have noticed from like pictures that you've posted of yourself, I was pretty sure you were tall, but I didn't realize you were six five. Um, next question. What is, I think this is a, this is funny. Uh, what do you look for in a second photographer for weddings? Oh, Devin is, she's, she's pushing at me. Um, you know, there's a lot that I'm looking for, but the immediate answer that comes to mind is, is a personality. Um, I look for someone who has a personality that is similar to mine, but you don't have to be a puppet. Um, wedding days are stressful. We know that. I'm looking for someone who has the ability to navigate that with ease, like a duck with water rolling off his or her back. And so, you know, that's the first thing I'm looking for in a second photographer. Obviously, I'm looking for someone who has a style similar to mine, whose values are similar to mine. Um, and this year, 2023 has been a breakthrough year where I've been able to, well, 2022 and 2023, where I've been able to secure three people work on the team as second photographers and even be associates when I'm double booked. And it's been great. And I, I, I have zero complaints. You know, we're all growing in artistry, but I'm really fortunate to have these people on the team. Um, our values align, you know, aside from, you know, working second um, as second photographers on weddings, sometimes we'll just hang out and go grab drinks or food or whatever, or show up at birthday parties because we're not just there for the wedding. We're doing life together. Right. And I think that's what really builds a team. I agree. I think that style and value adjacent at the, at the least, uh, but mm -hmm. you, they have to be somebody that you're willing to hang out with and like, and do you feel as complimentary to you? Not only just in the, the, yes. the photos, but like just complimentary in, in all the aspects. I mean, I remember, having second photographers who took beautiful photos, but I didn't want to be around them as a person. Um, and, and we really clashed like not together, but like things they said, I was just like, mm, I just can't, can't be around you. Like, I don't, I don't, uh, I, this is somebody's wedding and I'm not going to call you out on what you just said, but like, I, this is not the mentality of someone I want to regularly have in my life. And you, you know, that you sort of yeah. find out uh, and I've gotten to much more to a point of like, interviewing people before we ever get like, yeah and having like a we got to have a zoom call and we got to talk for a while before i consider like bringing you in on anything and my instagram dms is filled with other photographers who are saying oh i want to i want a second shoot for you or um, um i want to learn from you to send the other and the thing that really rubs me the wrong way is when someone messages me and says, hey, I'm new. I'm looking to build my portfolio for a second shoot for you because I'm not looking for somebody to second shoot for me only to build a portfolio. Right. I'm looking for someone to serve. And I don't know that service is on the minds of most photographers looking to build their portfolio. But my, my team that I have now, I serve them. They serve me. We serve our clients. There are times when my second photographer may see an image. I don't necessarily see them. I'm like, all right, cool. You go photograph that. They're like, no, it's just it's X, Y, Z. I'm like, no, you see it. You go photograph it. I'll hold the light. Right. I trust you. I'm demonstrating that there's no big eyes and no small, uh, no small use. Right. We're, we're a team. Right. And it's the thing of, uh, I mean, some of those other people I had uh, negative interactions with were people who would just like shoot over my shoulder because they were shooting for their portfolio. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, you're supposed to be over there getting a different angle. And they're like, Oh, I thought this was a great shot. I'm like, yeah. And I'm getting it. Um, 
my second photographers know the first way to piss me off is well the first way to piss me off is by not syncing your times on your cameras oh <laughs> but then the, then the sec- second thing is to photograph over my shoulder go find another angle a complimentary angle and go photograph that and if you don't see it we're not photographing the same thing because i don't want to pull the same images right there's there's no need you shouldn't we shouldn't have the same photos we shouldn't have any of the same photos. Um, all right. Last question from Devin. Uh, what's your process God, yeah. when you receive an inquiry about a job? Um, when I receive an inquiry about a job, um, full transparency, there's, there's an automation set um, through my CRM. And I do use HoneyBook as my CRM. So if the date's available, it'll send the, the client an email letting them know that the date's available. If it's not, it'll let them know that the date's not available. Um, so an email is sent. That, that should answer the question, you know. An, an email is sent. Um, got to have some trade secrets. However, man. with, with it, Huh? I said, you got to have some trade secrets here, man. Let's, let's find the, uh, oh. <laughs> no, with, with, it, with it being Devin... Um, because we have such a, a, a good relationship and we, we kind of tug at each other and, and give each other a hard time. Um, she knows that I'll Google the person. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to know who I'm working with. Yeah. Um, or who I might be working with. So I'll Google and sometimes I'll find a person on LinkedIn and just know something about them. And it goes, and, and it's not, you know, trying to size the person up or size their pockets up, but it really goes back to my intention behind knowing who it is I'm working with. Right. I want to know the person who I'm working with. And so until they book a call with me, I'm going to start to do my research and develop the building blocks um, on who this person might be. Now, that is if I am interested in working with that person. Because some inquiries I get, I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, that doesn't interest <laughs> me. So yeah, you do a little light. I'm not going to do any research. A little light internet research. The interesting thing is sometimes I do that myself. And sometimes uh, what I've found uh, a couple of times is that we know someone similar. We have a sim like a, a friend mm-hmm. in common or whatever friend. I'm, I'm using air quotes for everybody you can't see me I'm using friend in common. But instead of saying, I think I found the smart thing to do here instead of saying to the potential client, Oh, Hey, I know so-and-so because you don't know what their relationship is. Yeah. Go to the person, you know, and say, Oh, Hey, how do you know this? How person? do you know this person? Um, and it'd be like, oh yeah, we worked together a couple of years ago and wow, man, they, we didn't, you know, blah, 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 we didn't work out. But there've been times where it's been like, they're good friends and they're like, oh man, you should definitely like tell them I said hi. And like, you know, like I, I'll, I'll talk to them about you. I'll, don't worry. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, you know, hype you up next time I talk to them. And I'm <laughs> like, great. I appreciate that. Thanks. You know, like when you, when there is a good relationship there, like, yeah, if you're happy to let, let that person like it's the levels of trust that, you know, that you have to build with yeah. potential client and having someone that they know closely and is an actual friend, like say like, Hey, I know Casey, I know Myron. They're great. You should definitely like seriously consider them. I never say like, don't tell people like you have to hire them. Um, and like you should give them your serious consideration. Have we got a special offer for you? Do you enjoy listening to your entertainment? Why am I even asking, folks? You're doing it right now. You must. With Audible, you can enjoy all of your audio entertainment in one place. From bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, mysteries, thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and much more. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre. But that's not all. Audible also offers exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. Plus thousands of podcasts from popular favorites to exclusive new series. And with the Audible app, it's easy to listen anytime, anywhere. Whether you're out photographing landscapes, editing pictures in your studio, or going on intergalactic adventures with the nerdy photo crew, you can listen to your favorite audiobooks and podcasts wherever you want. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. So what are you waiting for? Go to audibletrial.com slash nerdyphoto and sign up for Audible today and discover your next favorite listen. That's audibletrial.com slash nerdyphoto. Hey, hey, hey. 
And now for my favorite part of the show. What's that say? Useless information. Ugh, this is always death. Uh, Myron, are you ready for your useless information for this episode? Bring it on. Okay. So, and you might understand, like, in the black and white television era, female actresses used to wear green or black lipstick. It's because, much like you think of, you know, we tend to not think about it today but like for photographers that's uh that should be something that you that clicks pretty quickly like oh it's because it actually shows up way better in black and white than red (laughs) red does not does not show up as well in black and white what are your thoughts on that it might be interesting to see you in red lipstick me yeah, why not? Uh, I mean, yeah, I can show you some pictures. Uh, okay. Last year, last year for Halloween, I was Sleeping Beauty. Well, my wife was Maleficent, so uh, I don't think uh, I don't know if I wore lipstick. Uh, I did have some rouge though. You know, got tired of pinching the cheeks to break some capillaries, uh, so I actually rouged it up a little bit. Myron, that's hilarious. Thank you for being on again. I really appreciate it. Where can people find you? Website is www.mfieldphotography.com. Instagram is mfieldphotography.com. And YouTube is mfieldphotography.com. Hey, how about that? There's some some consistency. Oh, TikTok. mfieldphotography.com. Wait, am I following you on TikTok? I got to find you on TikTok. Uh, I got to find you. Yeah. Uh, I will include all of those links in the episode notes so that everybody can find Myron uh, directly through those if you like. Myron. Again, it was a great time. Thank you very much. You're always welcome to come back. Thanks, Casey. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Myron Fields. Be sure to check the episode notes for Myron's links and go follow him on social media. And while you're at it, be sure to follow The Nerdy Photographer on social media as well. We're at The Nerdy Photo on Instagram, TikTok, Threads, and Reddit. And we'll have lots of content between episodes where you can either laugh or learn, sometimes even both. I even do live Q&As on Instagram and TikTok where you can ask me about all your photography-related questions or just your nerdy questions. I handle both. You can also reach out to me on social media with any questions you may have or topics you would like to hear on future episodes. Okay, now let's try this dance again and see if I can get out of here. Until next time, stay safe and stay nerdy. Access granted. Woohoo! Who's that coming back to town? You better start listening. Who's your heart been beating about? You better, you better, you better, you better listen.